Well, thank you very much. Uh, every time I come to this place, uh, I have a feeling that I've been in heaven. It's like heaven uh, because uh, of the clouds outside. And <laughs> no, not really. It's, uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here. And I appreciate uh, your invitation. I will always enjoy it when, when I came. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say a few things. Um, yeah, basically it's siesta time, and, and I understand that uh, you may want to catch a couple of these. Uh, usually when they ask me to talk about biomechanics in siesta time, I, I get used to it. Um, so don't worry, I understand. <laughs> I'll be talking about the scaffold net instability, uh, some, uh, some notions about the treatment. Of course, I will not cover everything. Uh, I will try to, to be concise and uh, to, to deliver some thoughts. The first thought I want to, to emphasize is the concept of instability. What's unstable? To me, that's unstable. Instability is the capacity of sustained load. A joint is unstable when it's not able to sustain physiologic loads without yielding. It's the fact of uh, being able to sustain physiologic loads, what uh, it counts. The wrist is uh, an unsta uh, uh, potential uh, destabilizing uh, uh, articulation. And we usually confound the, the wrist as if it was one articulation. Actually, it's not, it's not a joint. The wrist is a combined, a complex composite articulation formed by 15 bones. And the mystery here is why it has 24 joint contacts, 24 ligaments, and 24 tendons. If you have an explanation for that, I don't. But that makes, that makes uh, the subject a little bit tricky, a little bit uh, mysterious, and I like that. There's no such a thing as two identical wrists. You do four dissections, and the four dissections will look different. Not only that, two carpal instabilities are never exactly the same. And that brings us to the concept that despite they look similar, despite they, they they look the same, they are all unique. And that calls for individualized treatment. And that's why it's so important, sessions like this one, that allow us to play with cadavers, not with models, because every cadaver is different. So let's start from the beginning. What's the mechanism of injury of scapulonate uh, instability? Well, let's see an example. That was uh, eight seconds before the final of the last minute. You see that guy? Oops, let's see that again. <laughs> if you notice it, he was falling, but he instinctively tried to land on the outstretched hand. What he wanted is to create a stable platform upon which to activate co-contractions that would protect the elbow and the shoulder and have no injury, but actually it was a little bit too late. A little bit too late because the, the stable platform was not stable. And what happened was, as you will see, the scaphoid is uh, solidly attached to the distal row, the lunate is solidly attached to the radius, and therefore there's a torque producing and the torque uh, uh, injured first the volar uh, scaphoid ligament. And then the proximal membrane was torn apart until the dorsal ligament was disrupted. So it was a succession of injuries that came after that loaded hyperextension. And this is the phase of when he, it was only eight seconds before winning the championship. And he had to do some free, uh, how, how do you call it? Okay. And this guy, the stupid guy on, on the left, the coach said, come on, just sprain. Don't you come out and play. And the question is, what's likely to happen if he keeps playing? Because that can happen to us. We fall, we fall on the floor. It's, uh, it's, uh, it hates, it, it uh, hurts a lot, but uh, 
you keep going most of the time. If he keeps playing, the adjacent capsule will stretch, allowing further ligament rupture and bone subluxation. Once the dissociation is complete, capsule alignment will still be preserved by the secondary stabilizers, and we'll talk about that. With time, however, they may also disrupt the secondary stabilizers and the carpus will collapse. It's the moment of maximum instability. It's the moment of the building collapsing. Once collapsed, however, the bones try to readjust their, their position and the capsule contracts. The scaphoid typically tries to find uh, a, a dorsal radial uh, way to, to move away. So it subluxes dorsal radially. As time goes on, all empty spaces are filled with fibrosis and the joint becomes progressively stiff. The joint is no longer unstable. In the final stages, the cartilage degenerates and the wrist is not unstable but stiff. And to me, stiffness and stability are the opposite. So the evolution of scaphal neck dissociation teaches us something that is important is that it's not always unstable. From stability to instability, it grows, and then we have a carpal collapse, it's the maximum instability, and then we have something that evolves towards the stiffness. Obviously, alignment and instability are not synonyms, because they are well-aligned carpuses that are unstable, and mal-aligned carpuses that are very stable, stiff. And this more or less uh, follows those uh, stages that we have defined, according to which uh, stage one and stage two usually uh, deserve a ligament repair, ligament reconstructions for stages three to five, and then for stages six and seven, it's for salvage procedures. And today we'll be talking about only ligament reconstructions. We'll be talking about six types of reconstructions, some of them using products of this uh, laboratory, and um, that will be helpful for us to learn how to use them. Bone ligament bone is one of the earliest proposed. It's just as easy as that. We just obtain two pieces of bone with the ligament in between, and you just hope uh, for, the, for the two pieces of bone to heal in the scaphoid and the lunate, which are vascularly compromised uh, bones. But look at what uh, Merle concluded. In our experience, successful bone ligament bone graft does not achieve better function than a radicapal fusion. Actually, what we are doing is a very complex operation that ends up with being fibrotic. What about the Russell procedure? Russell procedure is reduction association of a scaphoid neck just to place a screw uh, across the, the, what we believe is the cause of instability. The problem is that with majority of patients in that uh, work by Larson, they found that uh, there was radiography failure of the procedure in the short term. So in their case, in their cases, the Russell procedure should be abandoned according to their opinion. Well, uh, I think that there is an indication for the Russell procedure, particularly in high energy trauma, when you should mobilize the wrist very early, otherwise the stiffness is, is uh, inevitable. And then the slam method. The slam method was uh, described in this, this house. Jeffrey Yao from Palo Alto in Stanford, uh, he thought of uh, using this concept. The tunnel across the scaphoid and lunate, and then he's using a graft anchor with a tendon graft that is placed in that tunnel and then reduce the, the, the instability and an interference screw that is used to provide stability. And actually we haven't heard about long-term results, but uh, so far the, the cases that uh, he's presenting here and there are quite, uh, quite substantial. <coughs> This is from, uh, from uh, two uh, Spanish guys, Bashauli and Lucas from uh, Valencia. They are using the same concept that like, uh, with the remnant of the tendon, they uh, reconstruct the dorsal scaphoid ligament. So there are, there are ideas here and there that are being promoted 
for instance, the swipe lock method. Swipe lock method consists on reducing the scaphoid and lunate with the 2K wires used as a, as a joysticks that are maintained to create that three, uh, three holes and then um, using this uh, swipe lock suture that I, I suppose that we will be able to, to, to work on them and to create with these uh, instruments to create a, a scaphoid lunate dorsal uh, ligament reconstruction. This is one idea and this is the push lock uh, technique that we'll, we'll be practicing later. I think that all these uh, devices are excellent as far as we understand the principles. Those are excellent uh, tools that we may use here and there. What about tendon reconstructions? Tendon reconstructions have been out there for, for a while, since 1972, that was the first use of a tendon reconstruction. Uh, we use them to, uh, to reconstruct, to, to replace the primary stabilizers, not only primary stabilizers, which are the dorsal, palmar, and proximal scaphoronate ligaments. Look at the, this is a, a, a fetal, a fetus just for you to see that the dorsal ligament is transverse, is thick, but the palmar scaphoronate ligament is more oblique with a, with a very long, long fibers. It's not the same, the volar than the dorsal. And this is a, a study that we have done to, uh, to come up with uh, what ligaments are really secondary stabilizers. We were applying an axial load and looking at the displacements of the different bones. And what we found was the scaphoid always goes into flexion and the distal row always goes into pronation. As you can see in this specimen, when we add uh, an axial load on the third metacarpal, it always rotates into, into uh, pronation and all the translocation proximally. So what ligaments constrain these displacements? Actually, those are the ligaments, long radial lunate, uh, palmar lunate triquitrum, dorsal scaphoid triquitrum, scaphoid capitate, and STT. These are the ligaments that are more taut, more tightened by axial load. These are the ligaments that we should consider secondary stabilizers. They all go around on a spiral pattern of ligaments, and those are the ligaments that we need to reconstruct. So based on this, there are a number of uh, ligamentoplasties that have been described. I will only uh, show you one technique, the ECRL technique, which is an evolution of the 3LT technique, is uh, based on reducing the scaphoid, creating a tunnel across the scaphoid like this, with a cannulated uh, drill. And then instead of using the FCR, we are using the ECRL for a, for a series of reasons that I can explain to you if you wish. The ECRL is passed across the articulation, the inside passage that I call from dorsal to palmar, then into the tunnel. And with this, we are tensioning this We're using an a, a interference screw to provide stability to this scaphoid and then the remnant is used to close the dorsal gap. Something like the 3LT, but using the extensor capillodialis longus instead of the FCR. Uh, as compared to FCR, this technique is much more effective in maintaining extension of the scaphoid and also to achieve supination of the scaphoid. Much better reduction. And the cases that we have done so far they close the gap much effectively than with the FCR. There's a ma macros technique that is more, compli more complicated, goes something like that. It's an evolution of the same concept. It goes across the triquitman and the lunate in this way. He closes it dorsally, as you can see here. I will not spend more time uh, defining all the techniques because I think that uh, Fernando will, will show us uh, his technique that, uh, to me, it's one of the best. I will uh, only uh, close this discussion by uh, saying this. In 1993, sorry, it's 1983, it's not 93, uh, Biegas uh, disclosed his series of 393 dissections of the wrist. 
he found that 28% of those wrists had complete scaphoronate dissociation. My question is, if in the aging population we have more than one-fourth of people with complete tears of the scaphoronate dissociation and they don't have pain, and they don't have any instability, what we are doing here? Maybe we should learn how nature does it, and maybe you should find a way of treating more patients more effectively. Because there are thousands of people out there with painless carpal osteoarthritis. Thank you.